Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Anna. Um, it's a great pleasure to uh, introduce to our audience, which I think, think comes from both Europe and the United States. So welcome, welcome everybody to this webinar. It's a pleasure to introduce Martin Westlake. Um, Martin Westlake um, is one of those people um, who, you know, unlike the rest of us who find it difficult managing one career, he's, he's actually had a couple of careers um, and he's been both a, a distinguished uh, European civil servant um, and a prolific writer and political scientist. Um, at the, in, in, in Europe, he's worked um, at, at successively in a number of positions, all of them very important, at the Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe in Strasbourg, the Council of the European Union, the European Commission, and at the Commission he's uh, worked at both the Secretariat General, DG10, G DG Education and Culture, um, and he served as the Secretary General of the um, uh, European Economic and Social Committee between 2003 and 2013. So a, a, a very distinguished uh, career as a civil servant um, for the European Union. Um, as a writer and political scientist, he's authored, co-authored or edited 16 books on the EU and European and British politics, including uh, his major political biography of Neil Kinnock, the Labour politician um, and then vice president of the European Commission. Now, um, he's not satisfied with being retired, so he continues to write. Um, he's produced two books in short order on the European uh, Union and Brexit, um, which one of which um, he'll be discussing uh, shortly. And he's currently a visiting professor at the European Institute at the London School of Economics and at the Coll College of Europe in Bruges. Um, so, um, the, the, the topic of Brexit, um, Britain uh, voted to leave the European Union in 2016. Um, it officially left in January this year. Um, the, is the issue, however, refuses to go away. Um, Britain is still, still dealing with the uh, political uh, fallout of that des decision uh, five years ago now. Um, it's certainly dealing with the economic consequences of that decision, uh, many of which are um, adverse. We'll talk about those a little later on. Um, and the de debate about why Brexit happened is still a lively one. Um, and Martin Westlake has contributed in his book, Slipping Loose, um, an extremely interesting perspective which looks at the roots of um, uh, British uh, discontent with Europe, uh, all going all the way back to the uh, 1960s and 1970s. Um, Britain joined, of course, in 1973 after much uh, domestic political debate. Um, so he brings to this topic a, a long-term perspective, which I think is which is which is very important, given the fact that um, political scientists uh, like myself have tended to focus on the short-term factors, the nature of the campaign to leave the European Union in the 2016 referendum, um, the uh, identity politics and populist politics that became caught up in the entire Brexit issue and the campaign, um, and on the nature of the vote. Why did people vote? Were people deluded by the, by the Leave campaign? Did they have uh, deep-seated objections to Europe that, that go, go, go way back um, in post-war European political history, political history? These are the debates um, that, we still, that we still have. Um, and you know, Martin's perspective is, is a salutary one in giving us uh, the depth and scope of understanding of where Brexit came from. Uh, it came from much further back um, than uh, David Cameron and his in-out referendum, supposedly, in the view of many, to rid the Conservative Party of the annoying fringe of anti-Europeans. For Martin, it goes way back, and that's what he's going to talk about. So, so Martin, tell us, tell us your view, pro provide us with your perspective and your view of why, of why Brexit ultimately happened. Um, thank you very much, Martin, for that um, generous um, and very kind introduction. Um, before I get on to the subject matter, I can only express my regret that I'm not there with you in person. Um, uh, as you know, when we last met in Denver, not in Europe, but in Denver, it was 
2012, I think, when we were on a coast-to-coast -coast trip. And um, we had dinner on the terrace of the Warwick Hotel, I remember. And we, were, we really loved Denver. It's a great city, wonderful art museum, and, and the best bookshop in the world, possibly, the tattered cover, I remember. Yeah. So, um, so I'm really sorry that I can't be with you. Uh, and I'm jealous of your students who are there because it's a wonderful place to be with the Rockies just next door. So um, thank you for the virtual invitation this time. I hope maybe I'll get another invitation once this wretched pandemic is over and I can turn up in person. Of course. Um, but um, uh, to come on to the subject matter, I suppose I should make it clear from the beginning, in case it's not blindingly obvious, but th that I was never personally in favour of Brexit. It's not that I've ever been a Brexiteer, but over my time which is about 30 years as an EU civil servant and also as a political scientist, I've had a sense of um, the sort of growing exceptionalism of the UK and a sense also that something, in inverted commas, to make it melodramatic, was going to happen or had to happen. Um, now, maybe you, you very kindly mentioned the, 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 the various places I, I've, I've worked in, and I think Actually, it sounds pompous and immodest, but I think it does give me a, a fairly rare point of view because I've worked in two European organisations. So I've worked in the Council of Europe, which is basically intergovernmental, and I've worked in the European Union, which is a mishmash of intergovernmental, confederal and, and federalist. And within the European Union, I've worked in different institutions. Um, so I have different, I've, I've been, I've experienced different perspectives and maybe I'm a little bit iconoclastic um, but I'm not hooked on one view. I'm open of course having always been an academ academic as well helps but I've always been open to various views and tried to work out um, some sort of more objective account of what was going on. Now when I joined the European Union back in 1985-1986 there was a real sense of um, the sort of the golden era, the heyday of the European integration process, but also of the UK's involvement with the European Union. Margaret Thatcher, who'd been fighting for her budgetary rebate uh, until Fontainebleau in 1985, seemed to be on board at last. The Single European Act was signed. Lord Francis Arthur Cofield was the architect of the internal market. Um, we had Samuel Britton, who followed on with competition policy and then trade. Emile Noel, who had been the first and only Secretary General of the European Commission for 27 years, was replaced by David Williamson, who had worked with Margaret Thatcher previously in the Cabinet Office in um, London. Henry Plum became President of the European Parliament. Julian Priestley became Secretary General of the European Parliament for 10 years. Graham Watson was president of the Liberal Group. Pauline Green was president of the Social and Democrats Group in the European Parliament. So there was a real sense that the UK had at last arrived and was on board <clears throat> and was part of this thing. And to come down to the very personal level, when I joined first, I was working at the um, Council of Ministers and I was recruited quite deliberately as a Brit um, with a view to the British presidency, rotating presidency of the council in 1986. And there was a big dossier that was coming up in the internal market um, council, which was what they called non-life insurance, better known as Lloyd's of London's interests at the time. So um, you had for the UK presidency, you had Nigel Lawson, the chancellor of the exchequer. My director in the council was Adrian Eakins Dokes, who'd come from the Treasury, I believe. Um, in the Commission, you had Francis Arthur Cofield as the Commissioner. The Secretary General, as I said, was David Williamson. The Director General was Geoffrey Fitchu, who'd also come from the, the UK Treasury. So it seemed at the time that the UK had learned to play the game and was playing it rather well in terms of placing Brits in key positions and making sure that they all work together at the appropriate moment. And I, I also have to say that there were lots of very good British um, origin EU civil servants at the time in all of the institutions. Um, they really did a wonderful job. I won't mention any names because there were so many of them. 
but one had a sort of a sense that we were there and we were working together to build something and that there was no longer this sort of sheet anchor of, um, uh, of British Euroscepticism. Then if I fast forward onto the, the, the Blair years, we, we get, obviously we've had John Major and his problems with the Maastricht um, Treaty, the Intergovernmental Conference and then the Treaty. We go on to the Blair years and the, the, something about his enthusiasm for the Euro didn't seem right, the single currency, in the sense that it clearly was something that distinguished him from his predecessor, John Major, but it wasn't necessarily something that he was entirely signed up to. And then gradually, I'm talking about the Brussels aspect, the Brussels perspective, one felt a sort of a souring uh, of the relationship and a souring of attitudes towards the European integration process. And then we get Gordon Brown, who's determined to distinguish himself from his predecessor. And at the same time, um, all of these brilliant officials that I've mentioned are starting to retire. And um, th th there is what the Irish now, I will come on to this later, the Irish are now calling a, demogra a demographic cliff edge. Because whereas the British have been well represented in all of the organizations at administrative level, suddenly they started to disappear. So we come on to 2013, um, Cameron makes his Bloomberg speech in which he first promises an in-out referendum. Um, Sir Ivan Rogers comes as a permanent representative of the UK to the European Union. And Ivan Rogers was going around spreading gloom and doom. And I can remember as Secretary General getting into an argument with him uh, uh, at one stage at UCREP about being too gloomy. And he said, Martin, you don't understand. You don't understand the way thinking is changing in London. Um, and he warned that this in-out referendum promise would be in the 2015 manifesto, and indeed it was. And then we fast forward to 2016, and hey presto, the UK is no longer a member state of the European Union after a popular vote. So that's, that's a little bit of the background. Um, on the, the academic side of things, I think um, we were still at the Badia at the European University Institute, Institute in Florence when Fernand Braudel, the French historian, first came out with his first book, La Méditerranée, I think it was, in which he, he put a stress as much on processes and trends as he did on events and personalities. And he took the longer term view. So he wasn't just interested in the sort of cycles that we normally have, especially we political scientists normally have in our, in our, in our view. Um, and so I started to look at some issues like um, the so-called Spitzen Kandidat procedure or lead candidate procedure. Where did that come from? Well, I knew because I'd been working in the institutions that it didn't just suddenly happen when Jean-Claude Juncker was um, elected as president of the European Commission. It had been around since 2000, 2002. So I wrote a working paper for the LSC, which was published. And then I, I, I sort of realized that there were other issues that were, if one adopted this sort of longer term approach, um, one could make more sense of what had been happening. Um, I didn't for a start believe that the UK voted to leave simply because Cameron was an idiot, although he may have been an idiot in political terms in calling the, the referendum when he did and in the way he did, but it was about more than that. And so then I was asked by a publisher, uh, Agenda Publishing, wonderful publishing house, to think about writing a book. And so then I had to start thinking about the structure of things. So we come on to the, the, the book itself and, and um, the issues that, um, that I examine or study in the book. And the first one is the referendum itself. Where does it come from? Given that back in 1973, we did not have a referendum for accession to the European uh, Economic Community, as it was then called. The other three uh, candidate countries, Norway, Denmark and Ireland, all had referenda. Norway voted to stay out, the other two voted to join, but we didn't have one. There was a parliamentary act under controversial circumstances, and this is all sort of prehistory, but Edward Heath even made a faux pas at one stage and said that there would be a popular support or popular vote for the decision. So 
we fast forward then to 1975, and all of a sudden we do have a referendum, a referendum on whether to stay in rather than whether to join. So that is the first time ever that a referendum appears in the British political constitutional uh, uh, setup. For the first time ever, it's about the EU, um, and um, the result is that we should stay in. But nevertheless, it sets an important precedent. And I'm going very fast now because I don't want to go into too much detail. But in the meantime, the referendum, which previously had been something that never occurred in UK politics, with increasing rapidity started to occur regularly until if I come to the Blair administrations of um, the late 1990s and 2000s, it was not only um, constitutionalized in the sense that there was an act that allowed for such referendums to take place, but it was entirely legitimized because there were lots of national referendums either taking place or being promised. Um, and, and, and therefore it had become a part of the political furniture. So that's where the referendum came from. It wasn't David Cameron who suddenly had an idea. It had been around for a long time. The second point though is why did David Cameron have this idea of a referendum when he had it in 2013? And there I suspected because he's not, I mean he might between ourselves and the three million people who are listening, he, he might have taken some idiotic decisions, but he's not an idiot. He's quite cerebral. And so when I looked into it, and particularly when I started to talk to people like Ivan Rogers, it became apparent that he had been ex his mind had been exercised for a long time about the fact that the UK, which was not in the Eurozone, but was in the internal market, risked being outvoted within the internal market with regard to the City of London's interests. That was what was worrying him. And doubtless the city, the interests of the City of London were lobbying him at the time. So he realized that the UK's economic interests, prime economic interests at the time, were menaced as it were by the possibility of them being outvoted by a majority within the internal market. So that's where Cameron's idea of the, the referendum came from. Something had to change. So he needed guarantees. And again, I'm not going to go into lots of detail now, but there were lots of in, uh, negotiations before the Bloomberg speech and after the Bloomberg speech, trying to give the UK something that would guarantee it its, its single market rights, whilst allowing the Eurozone to expand and consolidate without threatening the UK's economic interests. So um, I, I think I use uh, Chekhov in the book where I say, you know, Chekhov had this saying, if you put a gun on the wall in a play, make sure that in the next act somebody uses it, because otherwise what's the point of putting it there? So that's where the gun came from. Then I, 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 having um, thought about the internal market and the Eurozone, I then looked in more detail at the Eurozone, which I had assumed in all honesty, I had assumed that this was a relatively recent development, uh, monetary union that is within the European Union, that had come if anything from the 1970s, the Werner plan, but not before then. Well, I got a surprise because when I did my research, I found out that it actually came back uh, all the way back to 1964, when Charles de Gaulle was still um, president of the, the French uh, Republic. And it was a young, a very young, but brilliant French finance minister, Valérie Giscard d'Estaing, who didn't believe that de Gaulle's idea of a franc fort was going to, was going to um, guarantee French um, financial interests in the future. And who was very wary about the UK sterling area that still existed, hated the idea of dollar um, supremacy and therefore came up very early on with this idea of a single a currency area which later became a single currency so the vision was there for a long time and indeed when um, the UK was negotiating for, for accession in the late 1960s and the early 1970s both Edward Heath and Harold Wilson um, committed themselves to economic and monetary union on what they thought were the healthy grounds that it was never going to happen. 
famous last words. Margaret Thatcher herself committed herself at various European summits and all of the commitments are there in the book because nobody believed it would happen. Well, it did. And thereby hangs a tale, of course. Um, the next issue I looked at is enlargement. Now, we all know that there is this hoary old chestnut that UK governments, Labour Conservative, have always favoured enlargement of the European Union because that means um, that um, the EU is diluted. Diluted, the integration process is diluted and weakened. Well, I looked into that in great detail and I looked as much as I could in the archives um, the writings of people like Stephen Wall, Alan, the late great Alan Millwood, and I couldn't find any proof of this uh, argument at all. There was just one example when Callaghan joked about it with regard to Portugal in the 1970s, but otherwise it wasn't there. On the other hand, there were two strong arguments. One was um, uh, what we would call nowadays a transactional argument, which is if we let more countries in, we have a bigger market uh, so we have a, a bigger market to trade with. So that was a transactional argument. But there was also equally a noble argument, which was the democratic one. Um, we need to help these countries, whether it's Greece, Spain, Portugal, former dictatorships, um, we need to help them to consolidate their young democracies. And the best way to do that is to bring them in. And you find the same argument years later with Tony Blair with regard to the Central and Eastern European countries the, and Margaret Thatcher. I shouldn't leave her out. The best way to deal with, uh, with these countries is to bring them in, embrace them and make sure that they consolidate their democracies. All of that is very fine, but at no stage anywhere, foreign office, cabinet office, nowhere in the British political establishment, did anybody think about the consequences of enlargement in terms of the diminution, the reduction, necessary reduction in the power of any individual member state whether it was a large member state like the UK or a smaller one. Um, so that, that, that was fascinating. Here was an example of another trend which the UK had been encouraging, but really hadn't thought through. Um, I then look, and I won't go into great detail about it, but I, I, I look at the, the European Parliament and the introduction of proportional representation in the UK for European elections in 1999. Reportedly, it happened because Paddy Ashdown badgered Tony Blair on, on a plane trip to Hong Kong for the handing over of the Hong Kong to the Chinese. And Paddy Ashdown, who was disappointed because Blair won big in 1997, wanted some sort of commitment that he could sell to the troops. And so Blair gave him PR to the EP, to the European Parliament, because it didn't matter. Well, of course, in retrospect, retrospect it mattered hugely because it was through the introduction of proportional representation that the UK Independence Party first won electoral elections, contests, won seats, won resources, won a platform, won media airtime, and therefore was able to build a platform for itself, and we know where that led. Um, Another, which, which um, uh, more on a personal level, is this idea, I, I think I call it the, the, the mystery of the disappearing Sir Humphreys, that is the chapter. Um, but just the fact that there are so few, or there were so few UK civil servants left in the European institutions. Now, I thought this was, like I said right at the beginning, this was a demographic cliff that the UK was about to fall off because no young recruits had come in. But what I discovered was that it had always been like that. There had always been very few UK civil servants or UK origin civil servants in the EU institutions because the UK, the UK government had always neglected to make sure that it was sufficiently represented. Now, this is more an American concept than a European one. But if, you're, if you believe in representative bureaucracies, then you've got to make sure that your people in, are in there. And you won't be surprised when I tell you this, Martin, but when I was Secretary General, the French permanent representation were on me every year as they were on every Secretary General asking for detailed reports on the number of French civil servants, French origin civil servants, where they were, the proportion, you know, in terms of management positions and so on. So again, the UK had sort of neglected what seemed to me to be a fairly obvious um, uh, uh, concern that they should have been uh, paying attention to. Uh, 
Uh, I've mentioned the Spitzton candidate and procedure already. I'll leave that to one side, but it's an interesting example again of the UK just not keeping its eye on the ball of what's happening in the UK, because there the British Conservatives belonged to the European People's Party, as it was called at the time, and were there when the first ideas about the Spitzen candidate procedure were being elaborated and did nothing to oppose them. It seems very strange in retrospect. You have the power, you're sitting there, you have the influence and you do nothing about it. Um, and lastly, I look at um, opinion poll data um, and I look all the way back, all the way back to the 1950s. And it seems a massive irony now, but actually, if ever we wanted to join the European Union, we should have done it back in the 1950s. That's when public support was unambiguously most in favour. By the time we went in, and Edward Heath knew this full well, there was already a majority against membership. So uh, the UK joined for good statecraft reasons, no doubt, on a parliamentary uh, majority, but with um, uh, the people, the electorate already against. And whatever happened afterwards is that UK public opinion remained very fickle, uh, knowledge extremely shallow, high levels of negativity, rarely majorities in favour, unpredictable. And then when we get to the 2000s, the European Commission was so concerned about the state of public opinion in the UK that they launched a, a regular series of um, Eurobarometer opinion polls. And the, it wasn't just that they found that, that, that um, opposition was high. Well, people about the European Union, the answer was tended to be no. Would you like to know more about the European Union? No. <laughs> <laughs> they wanted to be blissfully ignorant. Um, not only that, but there was there was willful misinformation, consistent underestimates of the benefits of membership and consistent overestimates of the disadvantages. Um, Chris Patton. Uh, once said in 2004, will Britain ever actually join the EU? We were at the time members of the EU. And of course the answer is never now. Now we know the answer is never. And I think in, given all of that, one of Cameron's fatal errors was to assume a higher level of general knowledge. Um, so to come back to Chekhov, if you take the, the gun off the wall, then you shouldn't be surprised if the bloody thing goes off, which it did of course in, in Cameron's face. So my conclusions, um, Martin, you tell me when I have to shut up, right? So I'll oh, just come to my conclusions. Go on for the moment. Um, so uh, the three fundamental observations. I mean, there, there's plenty more granular stuff in the, in the text, but the first was made by um, a brilliant American lady already back in the early 1960s called Miriam Camps. Um, I think it was in 1964. She observed that the British don't like or have difficulty in dealing with progressive processes rather than static treaty-based organizations. So they're fine with things like NATO and the Council of Europe because you know you've got a you've got a treaty and you stick to it and that's what you do. So it's 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 static. But if you get something like economic and monetary union, from from the very word go, everybody knew that it wasn't complete. It was. I'm not a very good skier myself, but you know this idea of the shoes. When you start at the top of the slope, all you can do is stick your sticks in beside yourself, squat down and hope you get to the bottom. Commit to the mountain. Yes. Yeah, so um, this, idea, this idea of the shoes with something so fundamental as economic and monetary union was complete anathema to the British cultural Mm, philosophy, the way of doing things, you just don't do that. Now this was back in 1964 and I think I have a quotation somewhere from her which I'd, I'd like to read out if I may because it is it, so perceptive and um, yet again an American who tells us we Europeans what's what's going on. So this is the quotation, the Europeans have had one of the few compelling ideas of the post-war period and they have been fortunate in having highly intelligent, dedicated and persuasive leaders who have not been afraid of taking enormous risks or of mixing vision with reality. 
Given the essentially negative character of so much of Britain's post-war policy towards Europe, the lack of imagination, the timidity and the half-heartedness of the few British initiatives, it is scarcely surprising that the boldness of the Europeans shone so brightly by contrast that at times it tended to be blinding. It's a wonderful, it's a wonderful um, series of observations. So, um, my, second, my second point f following on from that is the importance of visions and visionaries um, on the continent, particularly French visionaries. And I think again, that the British have tended to underestimate the, the role of such visionaries and the power that they have. Um, I know Helmut Schmidt said something like, if you have visions, you should go and see a doctor. But if you think of the, the visions over the years, Jean Monnet, uh, Giscard d'Estaing, I've mentioned, Raymond Barr, François Mitterrand, Jacques Delors, Emmanuel Macron now, you know, the, the visions, the, the, the Sorbonne speech. Um, and, and, and again, I've got a wonderful quotation from Sir Roderick Braithwaite, former the head of the Foreign Commonwealth Office's European Integration Department, and also worked in the UCREP in, in Brussels. This is in 2015. We haven't got a strategy, not because we haven't tried to get a strategy. Every four or five years or bef before every intergovernmental conference, officials are told to go off and write a strategy. Why the hell are we in this bloody union anyway? And they don't come up with one because there is no sensible strategy, strategy that can be written for a country like this in an organization like that. I mean, we're always being told we should change and adapt, but we can't, you know. We're British, aren't we? We don't do that. What a wonderfully revealing uh, quotation. And the third, and perhaps the most important um, observation going forward, is I've come to realize that the UK has a constitutional inability to develop national strategies and visions, um, in large part because of the electoral system. Um, there is never such a thing. Now we're even in the midst of a, the COVID pandemic and we don't have a national strategy. We have a government strategy and we have an opposition doing their best to shoot down um, the, the government. Um, the last time I think we had a genuine national strategy was probably during the Second World War with the wartime coalition, um, which brought in representatives of, of the main um, political parties. Um, we've, had co we've had a coalition since then. We've had the Lib Lab Pact, but we haven't had a, a genuine recognition that this is a situation which requires us to develop a national strategy and stick to it. Um, and that was um, strikingly absent after the Brexit uh, referendum had occurred, because I think in most countries, um, given the enormity of what had occurred, I think in most countries there would have been a sort of a timeout. Let's have a think about this. We voted against something, but we don't know what we voted for. Should we not now agree what it is we want to look for? But no, we didn't have that. We had um, uh, policy making on the hoof um, from Theresa May and then from Boris Johnson, who was going back on things that Theresa May had, had negotiated. Um, but never did we have anything that was similar to what other, other countries would recognize as being a national strategy. And it all comes down, I think, I'm, it's not that I'm going to bang on about electoral reform, but if you've got a government and an opposition and the culture is that the opposition's role is to hold the government to account, then any issue, including European integration, is always going to be a, a matter of government and opposition and finding the faults in the other's arguments. And we've seen it all the way through from, um, from the, our accession in 1973, through the referendum campaign in 1975, um, through all of the shenanigans in Parliament over the Single European Act, all of the trouble that, um, that uh, the Eurosceptics put John Major uh, through with regard to the Maastricht Treaty and the Labour Party, by the way, all the way through what Gordon Brown was doing to Tony Blair with regard to the single currency, all the way through to Cameron. It seems the sort of the leitmotif all the way through is it's government and opposition and not a national strategy. 
And if you look at what's happening now, the UK still doesn't have a national strategy. Um, the, 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 the recent review, uh, uh, foreign policy review, is a partisan uh, document at the end of the day. It's not a national document. It's not something on which a national consensus was sought. So that's the book in a nutshell, Martin. Do you want me to go on about the other book or I sh should I shut up now? No, I, think, I think this is an opportune moment. Um, having you know, presented us with your three conclusions for me to just ask you a few uh, questions and then um, we can uh, turn the webinar over to our audience and have them submit some questions. Um, so I, I guess I have three, three questions for you. One is about you know, what ultimately explains this a combination of diffidence towards Europe. In some respects, you're, you're, you even seem to intimate that the British government is incompetent at, first, at, at, at numerous points and simply not seizing um, the moment and uh, developing uh, a strong vision or, or even um, at, the, at the relatively um, a basic level of promoting its own civil servants. Um, but. And, and, and when you look at public opinion, you find this, this diffidence writ large, diffidence plus ignorance, plus um, a total lack of interest in, in, in Europe. So there's a whole bunch of things going on. So my first question really is, what explains this? Is it some kind of long-term imperial hangover? Is it some, is, is it some sense that, you know, you know, fog in the channel, continent isolated this kind of you know island mentality um is it to do with um is it the problem of, of, of british elites that uh, they have failed simply to engage the population and british politics with the really important issues of the day and have clung to things like the Amer special relationship with the united states and so on what 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 ultimately is going on in the background do you think um, um, well, in a sense, you've, you've sort of answered the question um, because all of the elements of the answer are there. Um, the UK won the war, in inverted commas. It didn't lose the war. And so it was able to comfort itself with this idea that it was still one of the great powers. Um, and it continued to comfort itself with that idea through to, to Suez, maybe beyond that. Um, we were still investing in crazy high-tech projects through the 60s, as you know, into the 1970s. Um, military projects, I mean. Um, so um, there, there was this sort of long shadow of the previous grand imperial role that the UK had played which was certainly still around in the elites who decided on UK policy um, and UK governmental policy in the 1940s and the 1950s. I think you have secondly, there was, there was a, a sort of an ambivalence in the way the UK behaved, which comes down to um, the behavior of the leaders of the two main political parties at the time. Um, Churchill, when he was out of power, when he'd been voted out of power after the war, was looking for an alternative role and thought that maybe championing, championing European integration was the sort of the grand role that Churchill could play, which would put him, leave him still on the level of Stalin and, uh, and uh, Truman. Um, um, and so for a while, he was happy to sort of pretend that he was interested in that. What he was really interested in was getting back into power. And as soon as he did, then the, the Europe thing was dropped. Attlee, on the other hand, a lot of people regard him as being the sort of the villain of the piece because he was around um, at the time of the Schumann Declaration. Um, and um, so if ever somebody should have been, if the country should have been in at the creation, maybe it should have been then. But I think there are a lot of mitigating circumstances there that explain what was going on. I mean, Attlee and the late, the, this Labour government, visionary Labour government, had, were in the process of nationalising the coal industry. So the idea that they were about to, the, the, the miners would accept 
that they were about to hand over sovereignty for the coal industry to a European coal and steel community was just a non-starter. Um, so that, you know, it was, uh, in electoral terms, it would have been suicide, but even, even, even in political terms, it was just a non-starter. Also, it's forgotten now, but I think the Korean War broke out uh, two or three weeks after the, um, after the Schuman Declaration. And the UK, um, as a still a major power, major in inverted commas maybe, was heavily involved in the um, Korean War. <clears throat> and so Adley, quite understandably, his attentions were elsewhere than this sort of nascent effort by the six to get some sort of European integration process off the ground. Um, so if you, if, you, if you go further forward to Eden, Eden was still thinking in terms of um, a free trading arrangement. Um, it's fascinating in his, in his um, autobiography, I think there's one paragraph and it's a tiny paragraph about the European integration process, which gives you an impression of just how little it was, how small it was on his radar screen at the time. Um, so I, I think there was a very long shadow of the um, imperial decline that was still going on. Um, there was also a very heavy, heavy shadow of the UK's um, continued obligations. I've mentioned the Sterling area before. Um, that, that was still, um, a major concern well into the 1960s. Um, uh, there was this um, business of an independent nuclear deterrent. The idea that somehow the UK could still be a nuclear power on a par with, if not with the US, then certainly above and beyond um, France and the Soviet Union at the time. So all of these things sort of slowed down the realization in the UK that actually it had become something of a middling power, although a very special and powerful power. <clears throat> and mm, the nostalgia is still there. It clearly is still there. If you look at this idea of a global Britain, whatever it means, it's a lovely slogan. But what does it mean when we send an aircraft carrier off to, to Asia? <laughs> um, with all of the various countries that have to support it with the escort. But, what does it mean? Where are we going with all of this? Why is it that the UK still celebrates, however many years it is after the end of the Second World War, the um, X anniversary of the creation of the Spitfire fighter plane and so on? The UK is still living in the sort of post-empire world of nostalgia. And I think, and I know I'm going to be a little bit controversial in saying this, but I think that the Falklands War was a, a real setback um, in terms of the UK coming to terms with its real place in the world, because it enabled all of those who were nostalgic for the old way of doing things to come back with this idea that somehow the UK was special, um, which indeed it was. I mean, it was an extraordinary exploit. It was an extraordinary thing to have done. A lot of courageous people on both sides um, fought um, uh, and alas, many of them died. But in, in, in statecraft terms, it enabled the UK political establishment. Hence, we have Margaret Thatcher riding around in a tank at times to believe that it was still sort of, you know, this sort of pre-war power rather than the post-war power that it could have become within the European Union and which um, uh, it could still have become even even after it had joined late in 1973 if it had really put its mind to things but of course it didn't it was still thinking in terms of the Commonwealth uh, the special relationship you mentioned sorry I didn't mention that but it's just so obvious yeah. We, we, yeah. We're still obsessed. We, the Brits, are still obsessed with the with the Americans, and as the Americans like to say, I think it was, I think to be fair, it was under the Trump administration. But somebody said, I forget who it was, said, yeah, the the, the UK always liked to think no, it was the Obama administration. The UK always think like to think they have a special relationship with us, but we have a special relationship with everybody. <laughs> No, I mean, the, the Commonwealth, the monarchy, I mean, these are things that make, create a kind of alternative universe for the British psyche, right? That, that isn't there for European, European nations. And it's a sense of, you know, a, a bigger Britain that's not European, which is constantly um, in, in, invoked. Um, so 
then the question is, um, given, given what you say about British public opinion, which um, is, is, is fascinating because it, it reveals the extent of uh, public opinion indifference in many ways to Europe over the past uh, half century of, of, of British membership of the, of the EEC and then the EU, um, given this public opinion distance, why with the referendum campaign in 2015, and this there's a this spills over into through the campaign in 2016 into 2017 and 2018. Why is there this enormous explosion of emotion on the part of uh, half the population at least in favour of remaining in in, in Europe? Um, suddenly, you know, the streets are full of young people with the, the European Union. Uh, 12 stars uh, flag uh, uh, painted on their face uh, faces, people waving the European Union flag. Um, of course, an opposing camp waving uh, the Union Jack, but the enormous emotion and also enormous anger, acrimony, and the kind of passion in British politics that I don't think has ever been displayed before. You know, people in the streets marching on behalf of membership of the European Union, and of course other people marching in the street on behalf of leaving the European Union. How do we explain, I think, you know, we, we've, in the discussion so far, we, we've got a good intimation of what is, it, well, some, to some extent, there are other things, of course, what's motivating the uh, people who want to leave the European Union, but what on earth is motivating the people who want to remain? The so-called remoners, as they're then uh, called by the by the uh, Leave camp. Well, I, to, to begin with the personal anecdote, on, on the 23rd of June 2016, I was campaigning for Remain in the UK, um, in Jeremy Corbyn's constituency, believe it or not, in North Islington. Wow. Wow. And um, when I knocked on people's doors, the idea was to remind people that they should be voting and preferably voting to remain. So the reaction on the doorstep, assuming people open their doors, which most of them did, and um, you either got a big smile and the person on the other side of the doorstep said, don't worry, I voted remain, it's obvious. Or you got a scowl and people said, I thought the vote was secret. <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't get a single person who said, I'm going to vote leave. And not and yet, with North Islington, which is pretty well healed these days. But still, still not even in, in such a, uh, uh, how can I put it, such a, uh, a liberal um, constituency did feel people who were going to vote leave feel able to say what they were going to do. And I think once the, the Brexit vote was uh, came through, all of those people who had previously hidden their views suddenly felt justified and it was like um, the dam breaking. And so there was a great deal of vociferous um, triumphalism, uh, a lot of xenophobia, by the way, also really ghastly stuff. Manchester, that chap who was um, shouting at uh, an immigrant lady on a, on a tram, I remember, hideous stuff, really. Well, Joe Cox being murdered. Um, so th they suddenly felt that this was um, uh, a liberation, a justification. And so there was a lot of emotion on that side of the divide, because previously they'd felt that they had to hide themselves away or that somehow they weren't being respectable. And all of a sudden they were. On the um, uh, Leave side, I think that there was uh, a great deal of um, wishful thinking, otherwise known as complacency. I think it was felt, I, I remember, I remember um, the Evening Standards headline at midday on the 23rd of June was that, I think it was P Peter Kellner, classic Peter Kellner, um, Remain is going to win by, I think it was four or five points with a five or six degree margin of error. So <laughs> covering his bets, <laughs> covering his bets. But I think people thought this was such a no brainer 
if you are young, if you're cosmopolitan, if you're from the South, if you're Scottish, this is such a no brainer, we're going to vote Remain. So when the, 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 the hideous truth came through, I mean, that was a shock to the system. And um, the emotions were further encouraged by the realization that this had been done, not by hook, but by crook, with all of the, you know, the bus stuff and uh, the, the, the lies and the, 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 the various nefarious ways in which the, the Leave campaign had won the campaign. And, and um, a, a lot of young people in particular felt that their futures were them um, because there was I, I'm, I'm not sure now that political scientists would agree entirely with this idea that there was a sort of a dichotomy between the older um, generations voting Brexit and the youngers voting to re younger generations voting to remain but certainly there was a feeling that they were being cheated of their future yep. by these older people who were at the end of their lives Right. and had had very good lives, thank you very much, and we're living out this sort of nostalgia from the Second World War and what have you. Absolutely. And here were younger people who were being denied their, 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 their future. So I think there was a huge amount of understandable emotion on both sides um, and passion, um, which, by the way, people like Chris Bickerton say is, one of, is a good thing, it's a healthy thing, because it shows that democracy is working if people are actually once again expressing themselves vociferously um, and um, with a degree of emotion about political issues. Um, Gina Miller, by the way, herself um, has said, um, if, if, if Brexit did one thing, it was to educate the young about the importance of politics. Don't forget about politics. Don't be complacent about your future. Don't believe that everything, you know, is set in stone and that you just, just rely on everybody else to vote for you. And I think, by the way, I mean, just a, an aside, I think that will be important in the French presidential elections. Absolutely. Um, so I think we should go to our audience um, in a second. I suppose, I suppose one last thing that I'd ask you is, 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 is this. Um, you know, given that um, British politics was convulsed, by this shift and given that the victory went to a particular faction of the British Conservative Party um, and that you know the Labour Party played a fairly dismal role in the entire affair by you know, under the leadership of Jeremy Corbyn simply you know abstaining from the campaign um, and then ending up being severely you know e e even abstaining from the campaign perhaps if they'd taken a stronger pro position that things might have been differently, but then being dealt this heavy electoral defeat, you know, pushing them back in terms of, in terms of seats to the outcome of the election of 1935. I mean, th th this, this convulsion has totally, uh, well, ostensibly transformed British politics. The Labour Party is now on the back foot. Um, Boris Johnson is buoyed up by uh, the, the, the vaccination success. Uh, despite his his earlier poor performance in 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 the face of COVID, um, the local forthcoming local elections are, are likely to go badly for Labour. The North, the poor you know, places, Hartley Paul is having is having a, an a his, his people have gone to Hartley Paul to find out what's going on. This is Peter Mandelson's former seat, Peter Mandelson um, um, of, of of the Labour Party. Uh, what 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 can we say about British politics now? I mean, is it, is it has Europe has Europe and Brexit created a new cleavage? Is something else going on? What do you think? Hmm. Um, let me. I'd like to, if I may, I'd just like to come back on one of the things you said there. Um, hmm. it, it is undeniably true that Jeremy Corbyn was um, unenthusiastic. <laughs> in terms of his um, position with regard to the Leave uh, campaign in particular. The then leader of the Labour Party. Yeah, just... Then leader of the Labour Party. Yeah. yeah. Um, but he did, to be fair to him, um, and I did hear him say it, he said, we have to win this. Um, but he wasn't going to be at the front of the troops leading the victory, if you see what I mean. It had to be others. And to be fair, in a sense, um, 
fate intervened because um, on the 16th of June, well, let's say on the 13th, I think it was the 13th of June, so we're 10 days away from the referendum, David Cameron, who's uh, convinced that he is going to fly this thing by the seat of his pants, project fear, we're going to win it easily, realises finally that the thing is lost and that unless he brings in a cross-party approach. And so he approaches the Labour Party. And the Labour Party bigwigs, not Jeremy Corbyn himself, but Jeremy Corbyn let the others uh, agree, agreed that in the last week of the campaign, they would um, run a high profile series of speeches. So the likes of Gordon Brown, Alistair Darling, um, Alan Johnson, they were all going to make big set piece speeches in favor of uh, Remain in the last week of the campaign. And then what happened? On the 16th of June, Joe Cox was murdered. Yeah. It took a couple of days for the political establishment to get its head around this thing. I mean, it was, you know, ghastly, serious stuff. Um, and uh, I think the Commons was called back on the 20th of June for a, a day of tributes to um, their uh, deceased former member, Joe Cox. And there was an agreement on all sides that they would suspend campaigning for the last week of the campaign. Absolutely. But then, of course, so, you know, that, that's fate. There's nothing you can do about it. It's just something that comes out of the blue. But what, you know, um, among the many counterfactuals that one can ask about the, um, the, the um, referendum campaign is what would have happened if the Labour bigwigs had come in, uh, belatedly, admittedly, but if they had come in at the 11th hour as, uh, as had been planned. But anyway, it's all water under the bridge now. Totally, um, totally. Yeah. But on, so on the issue of cleavage, I think that the, 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 the I mean, I'm out of, not swimming in political science waters, I mean, serious political science waters anymore. But I think now there is an understanding that there is a new cleavage developing in um, democracies, not in Western democracies, not only in the UK, but also uh, notably in the, in the US, um, which is more about identity politics um, and community. It's identity versus community. So it's, um, in and looking out and being protective or outwards and being expansive, if I can put it in those terms. And then in a sense, um, what has happened with um, uh, Brexit, the Brexit referendum and the, the uh, general election, of the election of Boris Johnson, uh, are sort of precursors or announcers of this new, um, uh, this new um, cleavage in politics. Um, which will, in time, so they say, overtake the old cleavage, the old class and economic cleavages. But I, I, I remain to be convinced by that. I, I think that Brexit was a one-off. If you look at what Labour is doing now, La the Labour Party would like, would like the, the current leadership at least, would like as much as it possibly could to put Brexit behind it and to concentrate on other issues, because it it's done. It's, yeah. it, it's over and done with, let's get on with the rest of life. And so to a certain extent, the Labour Party is also ac accepting the, um, the uh, strategic approach of um, this, this slogan that I mentioned before of Global Britain. Uh, they're, they're actually buying into the, 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 the idea that there is a future beyond Brexit, which is about Global Britain. It's about other relationships. It's not about the EU anymore. Sorry, I went on a bit. No, that's fine. Absolutely fine. Thank you, Ma thank you, Martin. Um, so we have we, so people people should submit their questions um, at this point. Feel free to raise, not raise your hand, but as, submit sub, sub, submit because I can't see you. <laughs> um, just submit your question to the Q and A, um, and we have um, um, we have a a, a question from um, Abby Innes. I should say, Professor Abby Innes at the, at the London School of Economics, who, who asks, um, isn't Brexit the triumph of the most libertarian wing of the Conservative Party? Does Brexit constitute a terrible final confrontation between libertar libertarian theory and three-dimensional reality? I think she, what she's saying is that, you know, what, what actually happened 
is that you know everything you've said was going on, but in the minds of people like um, Boris Johnson and Michael Gove and uh, David Davies and so on, you know this what this was the the the, the ultra Thatcherite wing of the party saying we don't want any of this European social democratic nonsense anymore. Um, and we, moreover, we want the capacity to further deregulate and privatize uh, the British economy. And the, you know, the, the, the three-dimensional reality, of course, is that a lot of the people who voted for Leave and who now support the Conservative Party expect something completely different. They want money, they want investment, they want a new future. And so that this, this is, you know, there's now a horrible clash between these two, these two things. Yeah, well, it's it's um, it's a very good question, and um, uh, the points the points are well taken. I think, though, um, uh, one can. I'm not suggesting that the questioner has done this, but one can oversimplify um, the nature of the Conservative Party. For example, you mentioned David Davis, um, Martin. Well, David Davis lost the Conservative leadership to David Cameron. Why did he do so? Because he refused to promise to withdraw the Conservatives from their um, arrangement with the European People's Party in the European Parliament. It was Cameron who promised that, which gave him the victory, which led to him becoming Prime Minister. So David Davies, whom we, because he was made Brexit Minister by Theresa May, we think of him as being a Brexiteer red and tooth and claw. But no, actually, until Brexit had occurred, he was a realist, if one likes, red in tooth and claw, who thought the best way of getting on with things was to stay in. To take another example, William Haig, I mentioned earlier the, the, the case of the disappearing Sir Humphreys. Yeah. William Haig, when he was Foreign Secretary, was the first, the first minister to take seriously the fact that there was understaffing in the European institutions and to try to, try to do something about it. Of course, he was too late. Now, Again, much more pragmatic than the sort of ideological image that maybe one would like to portray these, uh, these people in, if I can put it like that. Um, of course, at one level, the whole of Brexit is about a struggle within the Conservative Party. And um, Abby is totally, completely right. I mean, a, a small, it's fascinating stuff for the historians, how a small, a relatively small number of um, hardliners have managed, the tail has managed to wag the dog and um, create this extraordinary revolution um, in terms of the UK's political, economic, constitutional future. I mean, including whether the UK continues to exist uh, as, a as a union. So, I, I, but I don't think the two, I don't think the two explanations are necessarily contradictory in the sense that these longer term trends were there. And even if Boris Johnson hadn't existed, some other, some other opportunist would have come along. Some other, the, 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 the um, how can I put it? Um, the, the, all of the elements were there. It was just waiting for somebody. Well, as Boris Johnson famously said himself, if the ball falls out of the back of the scrum, of course, I'll be tempted to pick it up and run with it. Well, the ball did fall out of the back of the scrum and he did pick it up and run with it. And, and love him or loathe him, he did it. But if it hadn't been him, it would have been somebody else, I suspect. Uh, somebody maybe we haven't thought of yet, but somebody else who was equally opportunistic. And we haven't mentioned people like Rishi Sunak, for example, who, are, who have always been on the Brexiteer side and are positioning themselves um, for leadership after Johnson. So, I mean, it, 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 you know, it's, it's peculiar because I think a lot of people make the assumption um, that Brexit was one of these kind of upsurge in nationalism kind of phenomenon. Of course, one dimension of it was, I mean, you've talked about nostalgia for, you know, plucky little England in Battle of Britain, you know, nostalgia for the Second World War amongst older voters, that's definitely there. Um, but, you know, at the same time, global Britain shows that, you know, the assumption that somehow this is economic and political nationalism is, is wrong. 
practices, people who, um, like Abby Innes says, who are, who, are, who are libertarian, who are Thatcherite, and basically support globalization. And this is quite different from Trumpism, which is a kind of retreat from uh, the US presence in the global order, um, protectionism, um, uh, pulling, pulling out of uh, former conflicts, international conflicts. So, you know, th there's a peculiar sense in which, you know, Brexit is, is not about nationalism, it's not anti-globalization, it's about a different form of internationalism, in, in, a, in a sense. And the people you mentioned, Rishi Sunak and so on, these are these are, you know, liberal globalizers. And the whole notion of, you know, Singapore on Thames, you know, making somehow the UK a derate, you know, a, a, a free market deregulated hub for international investment comes from that, com comes from that thinking. Now, I'm sure that when working class voters vote, voted for Brexit, that wasn't what was utmost in their minds, but that's what the leaders of the Brexit campaign were thinking. I mm. know uh, all of that's true. I mean, by the way, Singapore on Thames, there is a, there is a chapter in this book by um, right. Alan Bollard about yeah. Singapore on Thames, in which he, uh, he um, describes um, wonderfully well how Singapore on Thames is actually the opposite of what everybody thinks it is. <laughs> I mean, right, because Singa Singapore is not exactly a, 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 a leaving aside Right. Right. Leaving aside all of the authoritarian stuff, I mean, it's not exactly a free trading, um, you know, buccaneering free trading or, uh, uh, state either. But anyway, right. leaving that aside, I think maybe perhaps when people say Singapore on Thames, they're thinking more about this idea of an entrepot, you know, this idea like of free off forces. offshore market. Yeah, something like yeah. that. Yeah. Um, but no, I, I think um, I think we tend especially given um, our news cycles and our media and our um, limited attention spans, um, we tend to accept sort of simplistic representations of what is going on. And let's not forget, you know, you mentioned, you mentioned Trump, okay. It was, it, was, it was Obama who undertook the pivot to Asia, not Trump. Um, Obama, as much as Trump um, was angry with um, uh, shortcomings in international organizations, such as not, not just Trump, but um, even his predecessor, I think, but um, yes, in, indeed Bush was, um, with things like the, the World the Trade Organization, um, yeah. uh, what's it called in um, UNESCO. Um, these are long standing American gripes. Um, and it's Biden now who's overtaking the withdrawal from Afghanistan. Um, whatever the promise might have been uh, that, that Trump, Trump gave. So I think we, we like to sort of characterize politicians and, personality and personalities in these um, simple to understand terms. But the reality is a little bit more complex. Um, and... Mm, I have to be careful what I'm saying now. Um, I, I think we tend to give Boris Johnson more credit than he deserves in the sense that he personalizes as a personality um, trends and attitudes, which he alone is not responsible for. Does that make sense? That it, in, in fact, they represent a part of what has been going on in, in within the Conservative Party, certainly, but also within the political establishment more generally in the UK. I'm, I'm not going to be an anorak, but if you look at things like um, political journalism, yeah. um, the heyday of political journalism in Brussels, as far as the UK was concerned, was um, towards the end of uh, the John Major premiership and the beginning of the Blair Premiership. So we're talking 1996, 1997. The BBC had a big office here. There were, every newspaper had at least one, if not two correspondents here. But thereafter it declined. Um, and why did it decline? Because I think, because um, British journalists realized that if they wanted a future, it was better to be reporting from elsewhere in the world than from Brussels. So in a sense, they were reflecting what was going on but they were also sort of facilitating what was going to occur. 
Again, I'm not sure I'm making sense, but so um, that's an that's an that's an interesting point. Um, we do have a, we have um, some more questions. Let me let, there's there's a question from David Cleeton who says, "But Brexit isn't over. Um, UK may not be an EU member state, but there's a whole bunch of stuff falling under cooperation agreements on trade dispute settlement, on periodic reviews, um, um, citizen security as a continuing set of joint projects. Not to mention the evolution of services, especially financial service." He says, will the public simply not want to know what the British government is positioning itself to accomplish in these areas? No, I, I, is, 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 is the next stage of British incompetence, I, I, I suppose, <laughs> or not, not actually dealing with the post-Brexit relationship, which has to be resolved? Yeah, well, um, all of that is absolutely true. Um, I'm going to be very modest now and read out a bit of a blog piece that uh, I've just finished. Um, which will be going right. up on the NSC website quite soon. But um, um, uh, let me let me find where to read it. Yeah, I talk about the the, the so-called Brussels effect. You know this Anu Bradford's argument about the EU as a trade and a regulatory giant, right. and no countries, whether they're European or anywhere else in the world, can entirely escape its gravity. Yeah. And uh, I write, as the UK risks finding out, the bilateral trade deals it will make as alternatives to being an important partner in the EU's own deals will amount to pretty much the same thing. Any advantages gained will be small, though they will surely be emphasised as symbolic demonstrations of the flexibility created by Brexit. Behind this willful divergence, that's my polemic, is a massive irony for both the EU and the UK. They will remain major trading partners and the best possible relationship for them both would therefore be the closest possible relationship. But both risk considering that to be impossible. For the UK, Brexit must be a success. Otherwise, what was the point of it? Maximum viable divergence is therefore an imperative because any arrangement that leaves the UK closer to the EU will merely highlight the disadvantages of anything other than full EU membership. For the EU, on the other hand, Brexit cannot be a success, because otherwise, what would be the point of EU membership? In a hybrid version of prisoner's dilemma, both sides therefore risk ending up with suboptimal arrangements and a suboptimal relationship. And I think the, the, the questioner is absolutely right that unless we're careful, unless both sides are careful, we're going to end up with this rumbling on and on and on for years and years and years with both sides pointing the finger of blame and trying to out jockey one another and out maneuver one another rather than doing what would be in the best interests of their, um, their citizens, which is to try and facilitate relationships as much as possible and to try and guarantee as close a relationship and as smooth a relationship as possible. Don't you think though, I mean, this is a, you know, the, the, the Brexiteers have kind of, you know, I mean, because, because they wouldn't take any criticism, I mean, all of the advice coming from economists about the, 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 the consequences of Brexit for trade, for financial services and for standards of living, especially for those people who voted for Brexit living in the, um, areas of post-industrial blight in the north of England. I mean, you know, they, they now confront a situation in which um, broad swathe of business, which never, you know, which vote was never favourable to Brexit in, in, in the first place, now facing problems of you know taxation, documentation, red tape, costs that are putting uh, small business out, out of business who used to trade. And send products to the EU. I mean, the, the the adverse consequences at the moment are a little bit hidden by the general economic uh, consequences and crisis from COVID. But nevertheless, as COVID receives recedes, you know, the the Conservatives will be dealing with a huge amount of discontent and the knock-on effect of business problems onto uh, employment are likely to be also severe. So, you know, the 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 EU can simply say, well, that's what you asked for. Sorry, but, you know, you wanted Brexit. But for, for the British, you know, they basically dug, the, dug themselves into an economic hole, I think. I mean, let's not forget that the reason why 
Britain joined the trading bloc in the 1970s, despite all of the qualms and so on, was because the British economy was performing really badly outside the common market. And the big imperative to get in was, you know, they were losing, they had to get, they had to, they had to somehow catch up and catch up they did once they were in the common market. Um, but, you know, now they're out, they're facing the same problem that they faced ultimately in the 1950s and 1960s. They're not part of a trading block. They're a small player. Um, they've cut themselves off from the fruits of trade integration with, their, with, with the most successful trading bloc in the world. And so you say that, you know, that, that it's, you know there's going to be a long period in which they're mutual blame casting from both sides. But isn't it very easy for the Europeans to say, look, this is what you wanted. You've got it. And then, you know, for the British government, it's like, you know, bankers complaining here, industrials complaining there, actors and the arts saying that they can't afford to tour in Europe anymore because the costs are, are now so great. Um, you've got small uh, entrepreneurs in Britain saying that they have to suspend totally their uh, relationship with, with, with other traders in the European continent because, again, the costs are too high. You've got certification problems that are hitting the food industry it's a it's an it's a it's a kind of galloping disaster and the you uh, so i think for, you know for, don't you think that for the europeans it's like okay sorry guys but that's what you wanted for the british it, it's like oh my god what the hell are we going to do now and boris johnson will try and fumble his way through it as usual but ultimately you know things look really really bad for economic growth and polit political stability well I think one has to distinguish between Boris Johnson's interests and the country's interests. If one is talking, I'm, I'm being speculative here, but if one is yeah. talking about Boris Johnson's interests, then we know already that in the Queen's speech there will be a promise to uh, abolish the uh, Fixed Parliament Terms Act, which means that he can call a general election whenever he wishes to do so. Um, I suspect that all the, all the economic forecasts are that there is going to be a big um, economic uptick post-pandemic next sure. year and the year yeah. afterwards. Yeah. And if I were Boris Johnson, I mean, I hope he's not listening, but if I were him, I, I would call a general election whilst those upticks are going on and win it. Now, of course, we can't know what's going to happen in the local elections um, uh, on, on, uh, on the 5th. Um, we can't know for certain that um, uh, the current scandals won't have an effect on the voter, which in turn will have an effect on his leadership. But he still seems to be um, fairly Mr. Teflon man when it comes to all of the scandals, yep. that, uh, that, that all of the mud that people try to throw at him. So I think if I were, if I were Johnson, I would I would be looking at winning the next general election. That means 2-1. And then accepting that sooner or later the Conservatives are going to shoot him down. Because Conservatives are always very good at shooting down Labour's foxes, as we know. Um, so his, uh, this guy has only ever had short-term interests in mind, and I suspect that's all he cares about. So from his own point of view, fights with the European Union are good news. All of, the, 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 all of the, 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 the fleshing out of the trade and cooperation agreement that has to go on now, let alone everything else that has to be negotiated, that's all food and drink for his um, strategy of turning them into them, the enemy. And me, you see, they're being vindictive. They're not giving us because they're jealous because we might, uh, we might develop a successful Brexit model. Um, so they're deliberately trying to do us down. So in the short term, I think that's the Johnson, the Johnson argument. And I think it will be a fairly, probably be a fairly effective one. In the longer run, the country's interest as a whole is to um, come to some sort of stable arrangement that enables both the British economy and um, the European Union's economy to um, once more find a sort of a stable relationship which enables these, these trade flows to go forward. But I fear, I fear that we're going to have to wait until after the next general election to get there. 
Um, but there is another point I wanted to make, and it, it comes back to what and the, the famous Anand Menon uh, anecdote about um, before the, the Brexit referendum when he was in Newcastle at a public meeting and he was explaining to the, um, the public, he said, you know, all of the economists say that if, if Brexit goes through, the British economy will suffer something like, a, I think it was a three to five percent fall in GDP. Right. And a, 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 an irate woman in the audience shouted back, but that's your GDP, not ours. Okay. And I think that's a very powerful point that it's not just about the benefits for a country's economy, if the benefits are only going to go to the city of London. It's also about the distribution of the benefits of membership within member states. And I think that's an important, um, an important lesson, not only for the UK, but also for the, um, for the European Union and its other member states, as indeed are all the other points that I mentioned, by the way, um, in the book. And there, I've, I've, um, if you'll forgive me, um, Michel Barnier in his valedictory address to the European Parliament on the 27th of April, um, he said um, about Brexit, it's a warning and it's a failure, a failure of the European Union and we have to learn lessons from it. Um, and um, he went on to say that, um, why did 52% of the British vote against Europe? There are reasons for that social anger and tension, which existed in many regions in the UK. The same regions, by the way, between uh, brackets that Edward Heath was worried about, worried about back in 1973, but also in many regions of the EU, our duty is to listen and understand the feelings of the people. This social anger shouldn't be confused with populism, and we should do everything to respond to that in each of the member states and at the union level, and continue to show the added, added value of what we do together to ensure that we can be prosperous, independent, safe and secure. So this is not something, it feels like it's specific to the UK, but it's not something that's only relevant to the UK. Sure. So, I guess on that latter point, um, you know, the preoccupation of people with uh, the distribution of the benefits from membership and so on. I mean, David Levy says, um, you mentioned the long-term indifference to and skepticism um, of the British public towards the EU, but um, it was really at the top of people's preoccupations until it was combined with immigration concerns. Yeah in the wake of enlargement and the fallout from 2008. How important do you see the post-enlargement large-scale European migration as being in, fu in, in, in fueling the vote? I mean, one could add, you know, um, Nigel Farage and his appallingly xenophobic, let's call it what it was, blatantly racist campaign, his coaches with uh, posters of dark-skinned um, refugees um, saying we need to take back control of our borders, otherwise you know what, we're going to have even more of those dark-skinned people coming into the UK. I mean, I mean the counterfactual is um, probably in many European countries, people don't think about Europe a lot of the time. I mean, the counterfactual is, you know, in a country with a, a great deal of ignorance and indifference to, to, to the EU, Real hostility was only some the phenomenon that was 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 generated by the campaign. Um, I mean, you said earlier, and I think it was a good point that it allowed people a legitimate expression of something that they'd always hidden. I mean, maybe the the, the legitimate expression was partly anti-European. Maybe the legitimate expression of something that was always hidden was was racism. Um, and so, you know, it's like, a, like a, and this is true of other parts of Europe and, and other referenda that, you know, when you have a referendum um, amongst people who are giving a, given a yes, no choice on something that's very complicated, what they'll do is they'll simply grab the, 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 most, simple, the, the most simplistic idea to fill in the gap in their understanding. And they may, they may it may be, um, issues that have absolutely nothing to do with the question itself. So, you know, the, the, the big question, the counterfactual, I guess, is if you had had 
a different Labour Party leadership. If you had had a successful um, campaign against the racism of Nigel Farage and UKIP, rather than what the Conservative campaign actually did was you know, not articulate racism itself, but allow Farage to articulate it on their, on their behalf because they knew it would fly and, 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 and appeal to a large part of the population. If you had had a different kind of campaign, a Labour leadership who had campaigned in the poorer constituencies, a Conservative party that had combated effectively the dog whistling and the quite blatant racism, of parts of the Leave campaign, we might have had a completely different result. Despite what you say about the long term. Yeah, no, but um, you know, Martin, in, in the book, I say, I, th I think the referendum could have been won. Yes, yeah, so I was going to say, you do say in the book that you think the referendum, so, so what do you think could have won the referendum, given the long history of antipathy to the EU and indifference amongst public opinion? I mean, what could have done it? What could have made it happen? Well, if I'm if I'm if I may tease out different uh, elements um, of, of the question, Martin. First of all, David. Hi, David. You, your question on immigration. Um, I I think um, uh, yes, yes. Martin is right. Nigel Farage um, made this Faustian pact, and and um, became xenophobic in a way that he hadn't been previously. UKIP hadn't been previously, although of course the dogs were snapping at his heels, but he finally gave in because he realized it was a, a referendum winner. Um, but I can't, to be fair, no, no, not to be fair, to be objective, I can't help feeling that um, uh, those posters were a sort of a metaphor for the people who were living in communities that I personally know nothing about um, in the Fenlands or in um, uh, the Northeast or, or wherever, where doctor surgeries uh, were um, apparently overflowing with um, Polish, Bulgarian, and Romanian um, children who were ill, um, the children of workers who were working on the agricultural land and quite understandably and legitimately and perfectly nobly were there in, in the, the, the doctor's um, uh, waiting room or were um, had shops in the high streets or whatever it was. So there was this presence of a particular sort of immigration, um, Central and Eastern European migration, which um, brought out, let's say, the worst in these sort of nativist instincts of the communities that were crumbling away in these particular areas, which I, I was completely ignorant about, I must say, to be, to be honest. Um, and then you have this issue of Turkish, um, Turkish um, immigration. Okay, so we know the Turkish application for membership is on ice forever. Uh, but nevertheless, Turkey is at the moment still officially um, negotiating for membership of the European Union. So it's very difficult to deny. And, and we know also that Erdogan was holding out for um, visas for Turkish travellers, um, to uh, visa-free travel to the European Union for, for, for Turks. So it's very difficult under those circumstances for any honest politician to deny that there is a risk that you might end up with more Turks floating around in your system. Not that I've got anything against Turks, by the way, having worked in the Council of Europe with brilliant Turks. So the, 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 the UKIP was able to exploit all of those issues. Yeah. Bulgaria, Romania, Blair's agreement that they could come in, um, Turkey as a, and so on. And, and yes, Martin, to answer your question, as somebody with a, a, a more powerful approach to these things, um, who would have stood up and said, a shame, shame on you, shame on you. What the hell do you think you're doing? This is a country which has always, always stood yeah. up for refugees, always stood up for the, the underdog, has always benefited in turn. Yeah, unfortunately, such a personality was not available. Um, and it, of course, it wasn't going to be Jeremy Corbyn. Um, but then it, it, it wasn't anybody else either. I mean, the, 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 this... it's, it's, it's a kind of... Um, 
it's, it's a shame, isn't it, about British politics that it doesn't, it hasn't produced um, politicians of real character and caliber in, in, in recent years. I mean, it's, it's it, it, extraordinary that that didn't happen. I mean, during the Trump period, there were many, many American politicians who fought back against the, uh, the, the racism, the, uh, the, 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 the dog whistling, the, you know, the simply the, 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 the um, uh, modus operandi of the Trump administration and Trump himself to, to divide the country in the, in the, in the, in the hope that, and, and, and actuality that this would deliver a strong electoral push for a certain kind of nativist republicanism. Plenty of voices in the United States against that. And where were they in the UK? Yeah, yeah. I mean, you have to say where, where you know, Mitt Romney, uh, you know, where, where being booed at and so on, where, the, where, where are the people like that who are prepared to stand up within the Conservative Party and say, I disagree fundamentally with Boris Johnson's um, approach um, the races, the in, implicit racism, and, and all the rest of it. And, and also, you know, why didn't Jerry, Jeremy Corbyn articulate that message? Yeah, well, he, you know, fate again, fate again. Should the man ever have been leader? And uh, uh, well, anyway, no, he should, he there are lots of counterfactuals <laughs> there. No, but no, I, I mean, there, there are many, many contributing factors. But you know, I think, you know, and of course, this long-term, short-term debate was it the long-term factors was it i mean this is kind that cannot be resolved it's one of those you know it, it cannot be resolved but i think you know one could speculate about counterfactuals i mean if you had had i don't know a a, a, a powerful charismatic articulate labor leader um i think to invoke his name david Miliband, for example um things might have gone completely completely differently and i think that you know in the campaign articulating the benefits of the eu articulating uh, what you say is you know a, a, a disapproval for the 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 mutation of that campaign into an anti-immigrant uh, salvo um that registered extremely well in uh poorer parts of the country but also registered extremely well in the shires and the suburbs where there's a you know a long 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 you know a, a old age, age old residue of racism. Um, I mean, my family in the south of England, for example, racism and anti Europe has just been a staple of their identity for a very long time, and they're not the left behinds. They're the kind of beneficiaries of the economic development and, and openness uh, of borders that uh, the European Union has, has, has brought. So you know it's a it's a it's a it's a very, I, think, I just think looking back, it's a, Brexit is an incredibly complicated phenomenon. We still haven't totally gotten to the bottom of it, but, you know, with the help of books like yours, which I think are rather unusual in their long-term perspective and, and, and deep insights that come from that history, I think, you know, we have, you know, the, we, we have a much richer debate um, than would, would, would otherwise be, be the case. Um, let me just check to see if there are any other people. Martin, may, whilst you're checking, may I, may yeah. I make a, yeah, uh, I, it, it's late in the morning, the evening, um, but I think um, in due course it would be very good to tease out some of the elements that we don't know enough about at the moment with regard to um, such issues as um, Brexit, uh, populism more generally. Um, unfortunately, the late great Peter Mayer is no longer with us, but of course, as we know, he documented um, um, convincingly and empirically the decline of the mass political party. He was mm -hmm. one of those who documented its decline and its dependence therefore upon the public purse. And yeah. I think that when we talk about the quality of our politicians, I'm talking about European democracies, I'm insufficiently um, knowledgeable about America and Canada to be able to talk about North America. But certainly I believe that part of the rot set in when, um, and I think this was uh, 
David would probably know better than me that I think this was probably under the Blair administrations when a decision was taken that rather than to reward members of the House of Commons with pay rises, uh, they would be given the opportunity to make money in roundabout ways via allowances, which led in due course to various sorts of abuses that finally caught up with the system and discredited um, uh, Parliament and the Commons and MPs and Ministers in a, in a way which I think did a lot of damage, not just in terms of those who were already um, uh, active politicians, but also those who were thinking perhaps of coming into politics. And mm. I wonder if something similar hasn't gone on in France. You know, we forget about it now, but Fillon was guaranteed to become French president until all of a sudden we discovered that he'd been cheating on his allowances. But yep. why was he cheating on his allowances? Probably because in his own, from his own point of view, he thought he wasn't being paid enough or it was part of the system that he should cheat on his allowances to make sure that he was paid enough. Now, I'm not justifying the cheating, but there was this sort of implicit or tacit uh, understanding that you could cheat in order to up your, 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 your remuneration. And I think that's part of the, the reason for the rot in the quality of our politicians today. Oh, absolutely. And you see that across many, I mean, Italian, uh, uh, European countries. Italy is perhaps the prime example of you know, a total loss of confidence in political parties that has never really been restored since the collapse of the old party system amidst corruption and scandal in the early 1990s. Um, absolutely, absolutely. So it's, it's, you know, what we're really talking about here is a you know, the Brexit vote as a kind of uh, a, a vote driven in part by a total loss of confidence in the system. And here is an opportunity to express it in a non-party way. And hence you get this, this outcome, which many had not foreseen simply because they didn't understand the level of you know, democratic disaffection perhaps in large parts of, in large parts of the country. Mm. Well, great. Um, th I think we should probably draw to a close. It's now uh, 20 to 2 um, mountain time in the, in the West, in Denver. Um, I guess it's getting on for 10 p.m. or later. Um, 10 p.m. So, um, but, you know, I want to thank uh, Martin uh, Westlake very much for agreeing to stay up late. Um, and en engage in this uh, in this discussion. It's been uh, extremely interesting. Um, um, I recommend Martin's book, uh, Slipping Loose, um, full of many, many things about Britain's relationship with the EU that I hadn't previously known. Um, and his other book, Outside the EU um, Options for Britain, which is an, an edited book about multiple different scenarios uh, for Britain, um, uh, internationally uh, going forward. Um, and also thank you for our um, audience for signing on and staying with us. Um, so um, I'll say good night to, to Martin and good afternoon to those of us in, the, in, the, in, in, in our time zone. Thank you very much to everybody. Thank you for, for, yeah, thank you for everything. Thank you. Bye -bye. Okay, bye-bye.